Do you have another song? Is that the last song? Okay. All right. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and you can celebrate that we have, uh, by a vote of 56 to 6, and I don't know what that percentage is, but I know that's above 75%, uh, have called a pastor uh, to help in the ministry of the church here at Bethesda, so you can give God praise and say amen. <laughs> amen. And we are excited about the future that the Lord has for us, and we're going to talk about 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, and we're going to talk about our weakness and his strength, and we're going to think about sort of the chorus of a little song that we learned a long time ago, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. And so I pray that wherever you are in life, in light of what we saw this morning in God's Word, as the Apostle Paul was feeling a need to convince, in a sense, some of the people in Corinth that, do I need another resume? Do I need some more letters? Or can you see that on your heart, the ministry, Paul says, that I've been doing is written there. And it's not the ministry of an old covenant ministry. It's a new covenant ministry focused on Jesus. And we saw this morning that he hearkened back to the story of Moses who had been with God and his face shone. And because of that, he wore a veil. A veil that according to this past scripture would hide the fact that the old covenant did not abide in the kind of presence with God that we needed. And the people would have been able to see that while this man Moses had been with God, the result of that would dwindle off of his countenance over time. And God did not mean for our countenance to dwindle. He did not mean for our witness to grow dim, but for our witness in a New Testament blood covenant with Jesus that that we would grow in that and so we look in a mirror we ended this morning talking about God's miracle mirror turn to your neighbor and say you luck you didn't get close to it today okay some of y'all should have got close to God's miracle mirror because it's the one that doesn't show us that we're getting worse God's miracle mirror tells us he says with unveiled faces beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord as being transformed into the same image. So when looking at God's miracle mirror, we don't see us, we see Jesus. And we see us becoming more like Jesus day after day when we look in that mirror. And because of that, we see the Spirit working in our life. It's a spiritual mirror. It doesn't look like the one you looked at before you left the house. It's different and miraculous and glorious. And today we're going to look this evening in chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, as the continuation of this kind of life is and ministry is described. Let's stand to our feet and let's honor God. Chapter 4, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And our but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that there are not many gods, there's only one, and Lord, we thank you that you are God. And the Lord we saw this morning is the Spirit, and the Spirit is doing a great work in us, and Lord, we thank you that you want to do a great work through us. 
Lord, we thank you for the light of the gospel that is shown in our lives. Lord, we ask you to let our little light shine. That people would see it, that we would not hide it, Lord, that we would not lose heart. And God, as we have gone through many trials as a church, as individuals in the church over the last few years, Lord, that you would put in our hearts a zeal and a desire to make known the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. And Lord, it has shown into our hearts, and we want to let everybody know. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're here tonight, and we're here every time we gather because Jesus has given us his mercy and his ministry of mercy to other people. We can give that away. And because we have it and because we can give it, the Bible tells us we do not need to lose heart. I don't know what it is that would cause you to lose heart, but we can, in fact, lose heart. Paul has mentioned earlier in 2 Corinthians that there were times in his life where he was burdened beyond measure. Above strength, he despaired, he said. He despaired even of his life in chapter 1. He woke up every day feeling like there was a sentence of death on him, he says in verse 9. And he said, I want you to pray that I wouldn't trust myself not on my bad days, and we made sure we also understood Paul wouldn't have wanted anybody to pray that he trusted in himself on a good day either because that's how we fall into a bad habit. We think that we're responsible for the good and therefore we're responsible for the bad and all of a sudden we're not trusting God. But what we find is Paul said, thank you for your prayers because it's helped me to keep on trusting God and it's helped me to keep hoping in the future. There are a lot of people who've lost hope. But what we find that we as God's people, should not ever lose hope or lose heart in verse 1 of chapter 4. Therefore, since we have this ministry, have you ever received a gift and you opened it up with all the excitement that you utilize when you open a gift and you f figure out that you're looking at something, you say, what in the world do I do with this? <laughs> what am I going to do with this thing? You have to have somebody explain to you what it is. Or maybe it's something you thought you wanted and you open it up and you still don't know what to do with this thing. I remember as a child, I don't remember what year it was, but it was the year of computers beginning to be a thing. I remember first you just see them on TV, you know, being in a movie, somebody be on a computer. But everybody was getting a Tandy Radio Shack computer for their house. And I remember me and my brother Jamie, we just, mama, daddy, mama, daddy, we want a computer, we want a computer, we want a computer. So there was this box and at Christmas time we open it up and you get this thing out of it and we're like, what are we going to do with this? And I remember there's this other little package over here on the side and there was this little cartridge thing that would go in it somewhere and it was a typing program. And you would put that thing in there and it would put a, a icon for a letter this is high-tech stuff. And if it was an R, you'd hit R, and then it would go to the next one. It would put a T, and you'd put a T. And it was a type, type and tutor, I think was the name of it. Very, very unique and exciting name. And I remember the, the exhilaration of, oh, a computer, and then the, what would you do with this? And I remember for a long time it just sat over there. But now we're the same household I told you. We didn't have cable this morning, remember? We're going to watch TV. Somebody had to go turn the antenna. And our TVs, I didn't mention this part, were always secondhand TVs from our, from our grandparents in town. You know, they lived up on Snob Hill, like I was telling you all about this morning. And they would give us their leftover TV. And it was probably in one of those times where the leftover TV had died or the antenna blew over or something. And I remember thinking, well, there is that computer sitting there. Well, what are you going to do with a computer? Well, I guess you got a computer and it'll teach you how to type. You know what you do on it? You learn to type. <laughs> Therefore, since we have this computer, let's do something with it. And so I don't remember how many days. R, T, L. You know, you're just sitting there doing that. Now, I'm not a great typist to, to this day, but I did begin to learn how to type on a computer that probably had other capabilities. I just didn't know what they were. 
Listen, we all have something that I don't know if we've ever examined what we're going to do with it, but it's called the ministry of the mercy of Jesus Christ. Turn to your neighbor and say, you have that ministry. Turn to him now. Say, you have it. And you turn back and say, well, you do too. What are you going to do with it? Chapter 4, verse 1 starts off and says, since we have this ministry, well, let's use it. <laughs> let's realize it's a ministry of mercy and let's not lose heart. And as we do not lose heart there's a way we go about ministry number one in this kind of ministry of mercy that we've received that we can give away number one we need to renounce shame you know why some people who are saved never do minister salvation to other people because they've never let the lord take the shame out of their life God does not want you to be under the burden of who you were before you were saved. And all God's people should say amen. God does not want you to dwell in the hidden things of shame. Now, there, there's two parts of that. One is who you were before God saved you, and you're not that person anymore. And God has liberated some of you from a past that you don't want to testify of, and you don't have to. You didn't want anybody to know about it, and they don't need to. You wouldn't want to tell the preacher about it, and he doesn't need to know. And, and you need to let the Lord, through mercy, let you past that, because he will. When you look in the mirror, you're still seeing the old man. But when God wants you to look in his miracle mirror, he wants you to see the new man, new woman in Christ Jesus. And you need to see Jesus in that mirror so you can get past the hidden things of shame. Now, there's another side of this that can apply to you. And you say, well, I've been saved, but now I've, I've drifted back into the hidden things of shame. And God is calling you out of that through repentance and restoration. Revival in your life and that you don't need to go there anymore. You don't need to be that man, that woman who is hiding their life from, we try to hide from the Lord. Can I just tell you, we, we don't hide from the Lord. Uh, there's, there's no place high enough we can climb to get out of his sight. There's no place deep enough we can go to get away from his all-knowing stare in our lives. And so if you think you're hiding something from God, you're not. You may be hiding something from everybody else, but but God knows, and he says to us, Paul does, we have renounced the hidden things of shame. Number two, we proclaim God's word. We, we focus on preaching the word of God, teaching the word of God, not walking, he says, in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man. Every man's conscience in the sight of God. The way we teach our Sunday school classes, the way we do evangelism during vacation Bible school, the way we preach our sermons, the way you teach your children at home. Do we do so in a deceitful way? Do we do so in a manipulative way? Or do we actually just say, this is the Word of God, and this is what it says? Oftentimes, we can try to be too clever. I'll hear somebody do something. I'll think, wow, I, I don't know how they got such clever things out of that scripture. And, and the Lord continues to remind me we don't have to be clever. What we need to be is concise and clear. We don't have to be cunning and crafty, but we need to be concise and clear. And we need to commend ourselves, he says, to every man's conscience. Are we focused on making sure that people come and go from Bethesda more Baptist, more Bethesda-like, or are we focused like a laser on making sure that if a boy or girl's in your Sunday school class or vacation Bible school class, somebody comes and sits in a worship service, are we about indoctrinating them? Or are we more about making sure they are discipled in the Word of God? I, I praise God that I believe we sit in a place and worship in a place tonight that has maintained, I believe very humbly, a laser-like focus on the fact that boys and girls, men and women, they need the Scripture in their 
life. There are so many places people can go, so many apps on our phone or, or television channels somebody can turn to and in a moment be overwhelmed in a cesspool of a tidal wave of lies, of craftiness, of deceitfulness. And the Apostle Paul says, I, I've renounced all those things. We're not walking in shame, and we're not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God with deceit, but we are manifesting the truth, putting it out there day after day after day after day. One of the things that I think has, has been a strength of this church for years is from children's ministry to youth ministry to adult ministry, what we focus on is getting the Word into people's life. There's so many other clever things that churches can endeavor to do. <laughs> But there's nothing more clear that we can ever do than make sure that men and women, boys and girls, are presented with the truth of God's Word. How often? All the time. <laughs> Every time we're here. And sometimes in our world today, people struggle with, well, how, how many times should Christians go to church? Well, as much as we can. <laughs> Say, well, I don't need that much church. Well, here's what we have to remember. Other people might need that much church. And church is not just about us, but it's about us and others. And we're called to have this ministry. So since we have it, let's utilize it. And when we're here, we like to have fun. Sometimes I think I've been uh, probably noted as the, the killjoy pastor. Oh, well, he doesn't have any fun. He never has a good time. I have a good time all the time, but there's nothing I have any more fun doing than seeing people learn about God's Word. And who God is in his word and understanding it. We proclaim God's word. We renounce the shame of hidden things. Number three, we see an unveiled gospel. I'm not going to preach that for a long time because I preached it this morning. But he, he brings it up again. Even if our gospel is veiled, going back to what he'd already said, it's only veiled to a certain group of people. Now, some of you do other things on Sunday morning ministry-wise, so, so I'm going to hit it just briefly. The difference in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, one of them, but one very clear image, is in the New Covenant, the veil has been taken off of us. Our eyes have been opened up to the truth of who God is. No longer veiled like Moses was, we are now looking at Jesus without that veil on because the temple veil was torn in two. There is no separation between us and God. And now we can see Jesus for who he is. And we have that miracle mirror that helps us be seen as Jesus is ourself. And because of that, we realize we can keep preaching Jesus. You don't have to lose heart. You say, well, people don't want to hear it anymore, preacher. I remember back in the 50s, people wanted to hear it. I remember back in the 60s, people wanted to hear it. I remember in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s or the 2000s or 2010s. And some of you say, I've been alive through all that. I've been alive through a lot of that too. But can I tell you, people still need to hear the word of God. And people still need to have someone tell them that the veil can come off <laughs> that they can too see Jesus just like you have do you realize there are people in all of our lives who believe that Christianity is for you but it can never be for them and what we need to go forward doing is preaching a gospel of veil removal I remember that remind you that one of the most simple ways to tell somebody how to be saved is seen in chapter 3 verse 16 when one turns to the Lord the veil is taken away Go to work tomorrow and tell somebody that needs to know Jesus, you need to turn to the Lord. Oh, we've got to tell them a whole lot more than that. Well, there might be opportunity to tell them more than that, but if they would turn to the Lord, the veil can be removed, and they can be saved. The veil is over the gospel. It's not because Jesus hadn't died. It's not because they haven't been good enough. The veil is still there because they have not turned to Jesus. And therefore, they are still in their trespasses and sin. So we need to encourage people to turn to Jesus. Let him take off the veil. Number four, so what do we do? We preach Jesus. That's what we do. So if we want to go through life and see people saved, and we want to see revival at Bethesda in 2022, and we want to see the baptismal waters move and, and vacation Bible school be grander than ever, and the vans fill up again, well, they're already filling up again. If we want to see all of our Sunday school on the rise, and it is this morning, 142 in Sunday school. How about some praise to the Lord for that? Because a church is maintained 
maintaining a commitment to preach the word and to point people to Jesus and the veil can come off. And if we keep doing that, we're going to keep seeing God results, not Baptist results, not Bethesda results. We're going to see God results in people's lives. They're, they're blinded. They need something. They need the glory of Christ, verse 4, who is the image of God, and they need that light, remember? <laughs> that light that's in you, they need that light to shine in their life. So if they need that, you say, well, they need my light. They need more of me. No, they need the light that's in you. So if you want to get the light that's in you in their life, you know what you do? Verse 5, we do not preach ourselves. And boy, it's just hard. <laughs> in our commercial world and the way that people market church, man, it's hard for preachers. Remember last week I was testifying about some things I'm pointing at me again. It's hard for us not to want to get into church marketing. Well, they think their church is good. Let me tell you about our church. Our church is better than that because our church is this and their, their church is that and it's not right. The world doesn't need any of that. They don't need more of this preacher. They don't need more of this church in that way. What they need is more, more about Jesus. We do not preach ourselves. And by the way, if, if Paul could say he didn't preach himself, then Wesley has to remember week after week after week after week after week and be reminded they don't need you either. <laughs> they don't need more Wesley. They don't need more Paul. What the world needs is Jesus. We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. Now, what do they need from us? They need us to be a bond servant. <laughs> they just need me to sign up every day to be a slave of service for Jesus. Now, not just a doormat of life. That's not what he's saying. Because he says, for it is God who commanded light to shine out of the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light. We are bond servants of Jesus for his sake. And so all we do in our service to one another, to a lost and dying world, is to point men and women, boys and girls, to the gospel of Jesus. The veil-removing, separation-obliterating gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we sign up for service. We preach Jesus, number five, we minister as servants. Minister as servants. So I, I don't want to sign up to be a servant People said a long time ago, the problem with being a servant is that people treat you like one. <laughs> well, that's okay. Jesus Christ left heaven and came to earth and took on flesh rags, essentially. Limitations. Was tempted, but yet did not sin. Was bruised and beaten and battered in our place and for our benefit, and he became a servant to us all. Not a doormat. <laughs> He's still the King of kings and Lord of lords. He was the suffering servant of heaven so that he could take our sin and pay our penalty and so we could be saved and have mercy and have this ministry of hope and let that little light shine, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Shine it all over the whole wide world. Y'all remember singing that sign? Let it shine till Jesus come. Won't let Satan blow it out. <laughs> did I forget one? Probably did. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. That's what he said. We minister as servants, lastly, so we can let his light shine in our life. So well, I want to have a big life. I want to be an important person. You don't have to be important. You don't have to have a big life by anybody's standards. What you need to be is a light of the gospel that Jesus is shining. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. That's him who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. We can't get away from that gospel mirror today, can we? There we are again, looking at Jesus, the light of the world. The one who shone into us. And don't you know, you can take one light and get a mirror and reflect that light, and you can send that light a great distance. And what Jesus is reminding us, if we just let a little bit of light shine out of our life, whatever your platform is, whatever your program is, wherever God has placed you in his plan, let your plan be his plan, and let his light shine in you and through you 
so that as you are looking more like Jesus every day in his miracle mirror, other people are getting more of that light in their life. Now, what do you want to do to a mirror if you want it to be, be powerful? The best thing you can do is clean it. <laughs> Make sure the surface is reflective and clean. And I think one of the best things we can do tonight is come before the Lord and say, Lord, I know you've given us this ministry. We might not know what to do with it all the time. And I'll have to confess, I, I know a lot of us, this is the, the, the core of the church, not that all the core is here, but, but over the last couple of years in prayer meetings, in ministry meetings, we've looked at each other and said, what are we supposed to be doing? How do you minister in this environment? How does this program go forward in this situation? And we, we keep coming back to, well, we, we need to do something for Jesus. We have this ministry it's a ministry of mercy, and we do not need to lose heart, so, so let's do something. Let's do something together. Let's do something to show the light and let the light shine in our lives and in the darkness so that other people can have the veil removed. And I pray tonight that wherever you are, you say, well, I haven't had the light ever shine in my life. You may need to be saved. Or you may say, I've had the light in my life, but I'm not reflecting very much. Or you say, well, I've just lost heart. <laughs> I lost heart last week or last month or last year or somebody might have lost heart three years ago. And God's saying to you today, don't lose heart. You have this ministry. Do something with it. Let God shine his light in your life and in the world. I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes and stand to your feet. Lord, as we stand before you, we ask you to be glorified in this time together, in this service God, we thank you for the people of this church. Lord, we thank you for every one of the people in this church. Lord, we thank you for the unity of this body, the love that we have for you, and the love that you give us one to another. God, we ask you this evening to let your light shine in us and through us and do so powerfully and clearly. And Lord, whatever stands in the way of that this evening, we pray that you would deal with our hearts and we would deal with you. And God, that we would repent, be changed. Lord, I pray for someone to be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we sing, you be obedient. This altar area is open for a place for you to come and pray. Don't miss this opportunity to let God be God in your life. All God's people said amen.